Good morning, Lighthouse family. Happy Sunday. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I was honored when our very own Pastor G asked me to open us up in prayer this morning. And if we are ready, let us bow our heads and begin. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, to say thank you. Thank you for waking us up, Lord God. We thank you that you still have a purpose for our lives, oh God. Father, we just come before you to say thank you, Lord, for still making provisions for us during this uncertain time. But with all certainty, Lord, we know that you are the Lord over our lives. Father, we ask that you would bless the man of the hour and anoint the word that he is bringing forth. Lord God, we thank you and we honor you. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, Lighthouse family and friends. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you all for tuning in to our Sunday morning service here at the Lighthouse on the Pike Church. As you see, um, I'm kind of taking a seat today, um, not because anything's wrong. It's just that I wanted to sit down and just talk with you all face to face um, as if we're face to face. But no, I just wanted to kind of change the pace and uh, do a little something different today and just um, kind of sit here and casually um, have a conversation with you um, before. Um, we go into the word. Thank you, Adrian, for that word of prayer on this morning and uh, for assisting um, and all um, and everything else that you do here at the Lighthouse um, um, on the Pike Church. And uh, welcome to all of you all and thank all of you all for your support and also um, but your phone calls. Everything that you all do is greatly appreciated. Um, today, you can meet me. Our word um, will find us in First Peter chapter five. And we're going to look at verses six through ten. That's First Peter chapter five, verses six through ten. And if you have it, then you can say amen. I just heard somebody say amen. First Peter is before Second Peter, by the way, and on and my Bible is page 1016, 1016. Oh no, that's just a little friendly joke. Um, so uh, again, we're gonna be at First Peter chapter five, verses uh, six through ten, and I'll be reading from the ESV. And the Bible reads, my Bible reads, your Bible should read similar. Um, it should say, humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout of the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Jesus Christ, will, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Verse 11, to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we are gracious and we are thankful to you for uh, seeing fit to wake us up this morning. Lord, you protected us in our sleep last night. Um, Lord, we give praise to you because you have ordained for us to be here on today. Therefore, this is the day that you've made. Lord, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we give you all the glory in all that we do. Even in us sitting around our phones or our televisions or our computer screens, Lord, just to come together as your word says that we should not fail to assemble. So Lord, we come together this morning to hear your voice through your spirit, through me, this manservant, Lord, I just ask that you open up the eyes and the ears of our hearts, Lord, so that we may hear and perceive what it is that you would say to us, always teaching us to be not only hearers of your word, but doers and better doers at that, Lord God. So, Father, I thank you and I bless you and I ask all of these things in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. And you can say amen. Um, even though I read verses six through ten, um, I want to go back because there are two verses or three that I want to hone in on today after I give you all just a little context. But that would be verses seven 
which says that casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I'll give you the early, I'll give you the end part of the message right here at the beginning. Um, someone needs to know that the Lord cares for you. The Lord cares for you. Therefore, we should cast all of our anxieties on him because he cares for us. And then verse eight also tells us to be sober minded and to be watchful. And Peter tells us why. He says, because our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's looking for someone to devour. But verse 9 tells us that if we resist him and be firm in our faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering is being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the whole world, meaning that all of us in the body of Christ is suffering in the same manner and we are together, you are not alone. He says that uh, after the word, after we have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called us into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus himself will restore, confirm, strengthen and establish us. I've been having um, or I've, I've had um, even as, as, as of later yesterday, I've had conversations with multiple people. Um, some of you here at the church and um, some of my Christian friends in other places um, where because of this pandemic and including myself, um, I have to I have to admit that, you know, the pandemic has affected affected every single one of us in different ways, in different manners. Um, but one thing that we uh, share that we do have in common, especially for those of us uh, who are in the body of Christ and those of us who are used to um, our normal or what would have been our normal church gatherings here in the sanctuaries on Sundays and Bible classes and if you belong to other churches um, and even here whatever other auxiliary ministries that you belong to um, we had all we had all had um, a sense of gathering and fellowship within each other's presence, being able to uh, physically see one another and hear each other's voices and embracing one another. Um, and we've all been affected by that. We have not gathered here in this church. I believe the last time we was here was March 19th. Um, I could whatever that I think that's the correct Sunday. We have not been here since March 19th. So it's been over three months since we've gathered here as a family here in this church. So and the one thing that seems uh, to be common amongst everybody that I've spoken to in some form or fashion is that um, everyone has expressed, that's the word I'm looking for, in some form or fashion of the feeling of uh, disconnect, the feeling of disconnect. And, um, and including myself, disconnect in the sense of like it is, it's hard to, especially earlier on, but um, it's hard to be here. You can probably hear the echo if uh, we don't adjust the sound, um, but you could probably hear the echo. That's because no one's here. And I've had to grow accustomed to speaking to a camera. And then lately, um, the last month and a half, the brothers, some of the other brothers have been here with me. So I get to look at their faces. But for the longest time, I was isolated, especially earlier in the quarantine, where I just had to look at a blank camera and speak. Um, so I, too, feel the isolation and the separation and to be quite frank, some form of disconnect. It's not the same, um, but I've had to adjust to it. And likewise, you all have had to adjust to, again, looking at your telephone or your, your TV screens if you're casting it or your computer or whatever the case may be, um, and not actually having the physical experience um, of fellowship, which is why First Peter and last week when I spoke out of the book of James um, has been ministering to me um, here lately, primarily because we see, as I mentioned last week in verse one, um, in first Peter and in the book of James that the two of them are both addressing um, this Christian church who have been dispersed and we know that because Peter opens up he says Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion notice that Peter says the elect the elect the elect exiles of the dispersion and James as well says something similar. He says, James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ to those in the dispersion. And if you didn't see last week's message, um, the dispersion or those in the dispersion or the dysphoria 
some of your Bibles uh, may read, is Jews who have now been scattered out of Jerusalem. And more than likely, now there are some Jews who before the persecution um, that took place in the book of Acts chapter 8 verse 1, um, Jews had spread throughout uh, the rest of the world, but primarily these are now who Peter and both James are addressing are those who had now who have become uh, converts to Christianity. And because of this following of this new way, they were persecuted. Persecution began in chapter eight of verse one, the book of Acts, ch chapter one, verse eight. Jesus tells the disciples that, hey, wait for the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you all power um, to be my witnesses throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Chapter 8, verse 1 says a great persecution arose and caused the believers to scatter throughout the rest of the world. So Peter and James, they say, except for the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And Peter, um, we know Peter as the apostle Peter, the one whom Jesus found on the boat fishing. And James is not the brother of John, uh, as far as the writer of James. It is Jesus's brother, uh, James, who ultimately became or was referred to or known as the uh, pastor of the Jerusalem church. So they both are similar in their writings. They're writing to encourage a group of Christians who have now been scattered from their homes and scattered away from um, the rest of their other fellow believers. They all dispersed throughout the rest of the world. And the similar part of how you and I can look at that and make it applicable for us today, likewise, because of the pandemic, we wouldn't call it a persecution, but because of the pandemic, we've all been forced to shelter in place at our homes. And we, um, even though we look outside now, I guess everybody has forgotten that COVID-19 is still in existence. So I don't see a lot of people social distancing, but there, there some are. But the point is that we have not been able to come together as a family here at the Lighthouse on the, on the Pike Church or some of you all who are tuning in from some of your other local assemblies. Um, we have not been able to gather. So in that way, we've all been scattered to our own homes and um, in our different neighborhoods. And we have not been able to gather. And both Peter and John, um, I mean, not Peter, Peter and James, excuse me. They both have similarity in their writings as well. James opens up, um, as you heard me read last week, consider it pure joy. My brothers and that word brother is generic for brothers and sisters. So consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or your Bible may read patience and let steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Peter kind of says um, the same thing here when it comes to trials and tribulations as well. He says here in verse seven of chapter one or verse six um, in chapter one that in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So here it is. They're both addressing trials so that the tested genuine of genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold and more precious, though it may be tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So both Peter and James is, in, is encouraging the believers that's dispersed about that this here is a test of your faith. And likewise, you and I can um, extract from that, that here, even though we're, again, we're not being persecuted and no, uh, the pandemic COVID-19 is not a persecution per se in that particular regard, but yes, these things can be looked upon as a testing of our faith. And Peter says that we should rejoice in this. And likewise, James says that we can consider, think about it, find joy in the fact that the Lord has found us in his favor, that our faith has to be tested because it's going to prove something in all of us. Um, and I just wanted to, I just wanted to say that to somebody that yes, this faith, feeling that we have, this feeling of isolation, this feeling of uh, being deserted and alone um, is ultimately can be, um, we can look at it as a testing of our faith. It reminds me of the Lord Jesus, of the Lord Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, the Bible, after he was baptized by John the Baptist, the Bible tells us that he was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tested of the devil. 
to be tested of the devil. And ultimately, that is what the devil did. He tested Jesus' faith and A, on who Jesus believed that he was and who he was in relationship to the Father. And that's what isolation would do to all of us. We will begin to hear our own selves, our own voices, we will be able to, we will begin to hear even the demonic presence of the things that surround us that will begin to make us question ourselves and, and ourselves in relationship to the Father. And here we can find peace in James' writing and Peter's writing that we can consider it joy because, yes, our test, our faith is being tested. And just real quickly, um, and I won't be with you long. I know I've already taken about 10 minutes just uh, jumping between those two. But I mean, the, but there's, there's, that's a word for someone. That's a word for me, because um, when we get together, maybe we'll sit back and have some coffee. Um, I know I sit here and I smile and say, welcome, uh, Lighthouse family and friends. But no, me, your pastor uh, here, uh, my faith has been greatly tested during this time, and not all of it has been smiles. Um, there's been sometimes I had to lean and press in a little bit further um, just to hear the voice of the Lord. Um, Peter, Peter writes his book, as I've already mentioned, to a group of believers who have been dispersed from Jerusalem. The theme of this book, the theme of this book is how to live in a world, how to live in this world anyway, and bear under suffering, how to live in this world and bear under suffering or live in this world and go through suffering. Um, or a better way to look or another way to look at the theme of this is it's a message to strangers or aliens in a foreign land. Remember, these uh, believers had now been forced out of Jerusalem and they live in a foreign land. So a message to strangers or aliens in a foreign land on how to live and bear under suffering. And likewise, um, our current situation and how we've had to live, the, the country and the world, um, the rest of the earth, um, had, have had to readjust um, how we function and how we live and how we socialize with one another. So in a sense, um, you know, we can look at this uh, allegorically, in a sense, anyway, um, on how we've now become aliens and strangers to a foreign land or we've become aliens or we're strangers to this new way of living. And the book of Peter, um, the book of James, so I'm speaking about Peter today, um, tells us on how to manage um, and live and bear under um, the sufferings that come along with that. Um, there, this book, like the book of James, I love these, well, and, and there's a second Peter too, but these books are very practical in his writing. These books are very practical. It's not like Paul in the book of Romans where the majority of it is very doctrinal and we have to shift through and figure out what Paul is talking about. First Peter and the book of James is very practical in his writing. We can look and see, it tells us exactly, do this, do this. And he also tells us why. So the book is very practical in his writing. Um, the relevance of this letter is that we too are aliens charged with living like Christians in a world um, and we too are under pressure to confirm to the world's way of doing things. So likewise, we recognize as Christians that this earth is not our home. This earth is not our home. And we live and the Bible tells us to be in the world, but not of it, meaning that we are to learn how we have. We, there's no way that we can't not be in the world unless we're removed and taken up into space or some other planet or to be in heaven with the Lord. But no, we are to be in this world. And yes, we are to um, integrate and we are to socialize and function with everyone and everything in it. Um, we don't just live in our church buildings. We go to work and uh, we have neighbors um, saved and unsaved or and believers of other faiths. So no, we are to be in the world and but not of it. And the book of Peter or the let, this, uh, this letter to the church uh, in dispersion that Peter writes is telling us that we are to learn and we're charged to live like Christians in a world where we really are aliens. And every day we're pressured, the, every day we're faced with the pressure of conforming to the world's way of doing things, to the world way of doing things. Um, more recently here, the world is beginning to open back up. Businesses are beginning to open back up. Um, and I understand why. Financially, it has to happen at some point or else the whole world is going to be bankrupt. The economy has been greatly affected by this pandemic. So because the world wants to keep the economy going and many have lost jobs, 
Um, I, we all know people who have some of you all, some people who are very close to me have because of it. So the world has to find a way on how to get the economy back up. However, comma, the world has not found an answer to the COVID-19 viruses. And as we've seen in some of the other states that the numbers are starting to rise again. And some of us personally know, I personally know people who have died from it. And as much as we would want to come back, as much as I would want to come back and have you all here in this sanctuary, as of right now today, it does not seem like the wisest thing to do. So what am I to do? I am to seek the face of the Lord and seek his wisdom on what it is that he would say to us. But we're constantly being pressured. We're under pressure to conform and do things as the world says that we should do it. So just because some people come on the television and tell us, OK, churches, it's OK to open back up, just social distance and operate at half capacity or don't have any more than this amount of people um, in your sanctuaries and try to clean. I understand why, and again, I wanna be a part of it, but I just can't jump and do it because the world is now telling me that I can do it. Um, so I have to seek the face of the Lord, and likewise, we all have to seek the face of the Lord and gain his wisdom, uh, wisdom and how we are to operate in our everyday living from this point on. This letter is addressed to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion. We see that Peter writes that here. He says that um, that they are that these are to the elect, those who God has chose, who God has chose to be exiled. That right there is a blessing all within itself, um, because sometimes when we hear the word elect and we understand that it's God's choosing of a particular group of people, we celebrate that. And it is something to be celebrated if God has found us worthy of any call, if we if we found ourselves in the worthiness of God calling. But because, but to be chosen by God is not always easy. It's not always easy. Um, oftentimes to be chosen by God will throw you in a place of exile. Just by this alone, the Lord tells the Lord says to be holy as I am holy. And the word holiness or holy have been has been used so wrongly um, just throughout time. Even when we joke with one another or people have ridiculed us, oh, such and such thinks that they're holy or they're more holier than I. Well, technically you should be because the word holy means to be set apart or to be different. So when God says, I am different than you, he says, so therefore, I expect for you to be different or I am set apart. I expect for you to be set apart. So technically, we should be different. Technically, we should. That doesn't mean that we should be arrogant, but something about our lifestyle should be different than the world around us. And that's including family and friends in some cases. So oftentimes, if we look at it figuratively and literally, we are exiled. We end up being in a dispersion of some sorts right in our own homes and right in our own neighborhoods. So Paul, I mean, Peter now writes and says that this letter, he addresses the letter to those who are God's elect to be in the dispersion or to be dispersed or dispersed throughout the world. So if you find yourself, if you find yourself in right smack dab in the middle of God's calling on your life. God has called you to be separated. And sometimes we're going to feel that loneliness um, that comes along with now I have to make a choice to follow Jesus or still be a part of the larger crowd. Jesus found Peter on his boat working as Peter did every morning. And Jesus tells Peter to get off your boat and follow me. And likewise, the Lord and, and, and Peter was elected by Jesus. And likewise, you and I have been elected by God for this time and for this place. So the letter is addressed to those who was in the dispersion, those who was considered God elect, God's elect to be in this particular uh, suffering in that particular life. And he has called them in this epistle, or this epistle can be also looked at the epistle of living hope. You and I have to know that the hope of Jesus Christ is still alive. And it talks of the hope of the believers in the midst of a hostile world. Yes, we live in a hostile world as well. Um, all you have to do is just turn on the news and currently just looking at um, some of the writing and the protest um, of the injustices that have been uh, placed upon um, um, blacks and the history of this country and the anger that have now 
arose and by right also the righteous indignation out of somewhere now it's time to take a stand the world is very hostile toward one another right now i um, mean even in other countries the world is very hostile to one another so this book or this writing it talks about having hope for the believers in the midst of a hostile world those who are god's elect in the exiles of the dispersion are those who stood in the midst of of oppressive world and who realize that their need for endurance and unswaving and unswerving loyalty, um, unserving, unswerving, I'm sorry, I can't talk today, unswerving loyalty to Jesus Christ. And again, as I mentioned, this book is very practical. Let me run through this real quick because I want to get to verse six and I already promised you that I won't be with you long. I just want to leave you a word of encouragement. Here's how we can see the very, the, the practicality of this book in chapter one. Peter talks about how we're called to be holy and holy and how we are to behave in relation to God. Chapter one tells believers on how they are called. They're called to be holy and their holiness should show how we are to behave in relation to God. Chapter two talks about how we are to be like Christ, how we are to be like Christ. He was the rejected living stone and therefore we are to behave like living stones before or in the presence of the unsaved. Jesus was the living stone and he was rejected. And likewise, we are to behave like him, like living stones before the unsaved world. Chapter three talks about how wives and husbands are to behave with one another and also how Christians are to behave with one another. So it's very um, practical on how we are to behave with one another um, and how families are to behave one another. Chapter four talks about how we are to behave in general, just everyday general living. And then chapter five addresses how we are to behave as a church, which brings me to my verses today. Now, the first half of chapter five or chapter five within itself is addressed um, in its writing to two groups of people. Um, I did not read chapter one through five, but chapter one through five is talking to the pastor, to the pastor of the church, or as Peter calls him, the elder. And the elder, when we see the word elder used by Peter and Paul, when he writes to Timothy, and, and um, when he writes to Timothy, um, he, he uses this word elder, and this word elder is interchangeable. It's uh, synonymous with overseer and pastor and bishop. So we see that Peter addresses the pastor in chapters one, I mean, in verses one through five. And he says, I exhort you elders and uh, as I am a fellow elder with you and a witness to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. So Peter says, hey, I'm an elder with you and I am a witness to the things that he has suffered and also the things that I've suffered as well. Um, and he says, uh, he talks about sufferings for Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. He tells the pastors in verse two to shepherd the flock of God that is among you and exercising oversight and do not um, do it under compulsion, um, but willingly as God would have you and not for shameful gain not for shameful gain, but eagerly and not domineering um, over those who have been placed under your charge and being examples to the flock. And then in the second half, in verse five, he says, likewise, you are younger. And Peter is not talking about more of the age of the individuals, more than this is kind of like rabbinical um, language that the rabbis would use as a spiritual father to his children. So he calls one an elder referring to the pastor. And then he talks about the younger as those who are members of the flock about submitting yourselves um, to the elder as well as having humility toward one another. Remember verse five talks about I me. Mean, chapter five talks about how we are to behave with one another. So as he begins to talk to the church, it becomes in inclusive to the whole church from the leader to those who are the followers from the pastor or the shepherd to the flock. And he says in verse five, that, hey, that you are to clothe yourselves, all of you, he says, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Well, Pastor G, what does this have to do with me being in seclusion? Well, the point is that he's telling us to how we are to operate as a church um, and how we are to operate with one another. He says that we are to clothe ourselves with humility. And now this clothe yourselves with humility, literally, when you look at his translation, is really talking about dressing yourself properly and it's referring to or tie around your neck properly a cape 
tie around your neck properly. Well, what does a cape have to do with clothing yourself properly? Well, I'm glad you asked. I just heard you ask that question because it is talking about the garments or the clothing of a slave. It's talking about the garment or the clothing of a slave where a slave during this particular time would have some type of a cape or a white apron tied around him to a, identify him or her as a slave and to show that they were servants. They were servants. So now when we look at this, Peter says, um, likewise, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. We are all to dress ourselves as a servant or as a slave, as James, I'm going to keep going back and forth, um, back to the book of James as well, because remember, James writes that he was a servant and that word literally translates slave to God, the father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So likewise, Peter is saying the same thing that we are to properly clothe ourselves. We should be marked. There should be something about us that should uh signify and also separate us to show our lifestyle should reflect that we are servants, literally slaves to the most high God, meaning that he has full, full ownership over us. We belong to him. And there is something about us that should show and identify us that we serve him. And because we serve him, we should serve one another. Likewise. So he says, close yourself with humility for God opposes those who are proud. So a slave, a servant is always humble. A servant or a slave does not exalt himself to be equal with his master or his Lord. Likewise, we cannot see ourselves um, as being equal with God either. We cannot see ourselves being equal with God. Well, someone would say, well, how would I do that when we begin to make plans and think for ourselves? When we find ourselves in pandemics where we're uh, where we have to quarantine ourselves or if we were to be in a dispersion like those like these believers and who we are reading about as they begin to go about and they begin to doubt God. As if God isn't with them and they begin to make plans or think of themselves as if they have the ability to make their own way through the situation. So the Bible says that you are to dress yourselves with humility. We should show ourselves as humble as servants to God and one another for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble I'm supposed to be sitting down and I feel like standing up but I'm gonna stay right here I'm gonna stay right here the camera Antoine already has the camera fixed and you all ain't not gonna see me I can't go to my podium back there somewhere and so then and that's how it brings us to our text today in verse six he's laughing I feel like getting up man um, he's so which brings us to our text in verse six because verse six says now humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so at the proper time that he will exalt you. So he says that we are to humble ourselves or dress ourselves with humility and to humble ourselves toward one another. For God opposes the proud and he gives grace to those who are humble. And we can't or we don't have to look at it as if, well, I mean, and we should. Well, I'm humil I'm, I'm being humble to you and you being humble to me or I'm submitting to you as you submit to me. And technically we are. And that's what uh, the Bible tells us as far as wives and husbands. Peter talked about that earlier, that husbands submit to what your wives, wives submit to your husband. It's talking about the relationship between Christ and his body. And likewise, we are to humble or submit ourselves to one another. Jesus says the greatest amongst you will be your servant. The greatest amongst you will be your slave is what it translates. For God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Verse six says, Humble yourselves, therefore, watch this, under the mighty hand of God. We see the mighty hand of God, and that is um, the, the wording gives us a picture of God's authority, the mighty hand of the ruling hand of God. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's rule and authority. Why do we ask? Why? I'm glad you ask. Peter tells us why that we are to humble ourselves at the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time, what is the proper time? Whenever God gets ready. The time that God has already preordained when you became his elect. God already had you in mind from the creation, from the foundations of the world, that at the proper time that he will exalt you. He will exalt you. So if there's any one of you 
that feels that God does not see you or God does not hear you. God cares for you. And Peter tells us that in, chat, in the next verse, in verse seven. But he cares for you so much that if you will keep yourself submitted and humbled and live according to his ways with one another, as well as you submit yourself to him, I have to be humble before you. You have to be humble before me. We have to be humble with one another. We are to be servants to one another. We are to put others' cares and needs before ours. When we find ourselves doing that and we do not exalt ourselves, the Bible says that in God's timing, in God's elect time, that he himself will exalt us. The Bible says at the proper time. Well, we want to know, all of us want to know what time that is. The Lord doesn't tell us that. But when we conduct ourselves as servants, when we conduct ourselves as servants, we wake up in a day, a particular day that we call that this is the day. What day is that? The day that the Lord has made. So in his proper time, he will exhaust us. Now, verse seven is what I'm really after. And I'm going to close because I'm, but I really want to get with verse seven, eight and nine. Because here's where all of us can share. Um, it may be a different story, but all of us can share a commonality of what we've been facing in this time. Verse seven says, casting all your cares or casting all of your anxieties is what it says. Casting all of your anxieties on him. Cast. Jesus tells Peter to throw or cast his net back into the water, or cast it on the other side. And that's what this word cast means, that literally you are to take all of your worries and your anxieties and you are to literally throw them away or throw them at or throw them on the Lord. Throw them on the Lord. We're to cast our anxieties on him. It did not say that we are to cast our anxieties on one another, even though the Bible does tell us to bear up with one another. The truth of the matter is, I'm facing anxieties just like you are and you are facing anxieties of some sort just like I am and you're facing anxieties just like whoever you may call to help or try to get you to feel better. Your prayer partners, your accountability partners, everyone has been affected and everyone is facing some anxieties. But there is one person who can free us from all anxieties, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter tells us that we are to cast our cares on him for one reason, and one reason alone we're allowed to do this, because he cares for you, because he cares for you. If you have not heard anything that I've said today, hear this, please write it down, make a note of it, put it in the notes of your iPhone or your iPad, write it on your computer, get a piece of chalk or lipstick or something, write it on your mirror in the bathroom that the Lord cares for you. He cares for you. He sees you. He has not forgotten about you. You are not alone ever. I don't care if you call everyone in your phone or your Rolodex or your little book, I don't care whatever it is, that if you cannot get a hold of anyone, if you were to go outside and you couldn't find another person for the next 10 miles, know that you are not alone. You are not by yourself. You are not separated for the Lord is always with you. And Peter tells us that he cares for you. Therefore, cast all your anxieties on him. So now we have to now not also should we cast our anxieties on him? We have to, because when we become anxious and when we become worried, we are no longer sober minded. And we often begin to make decisions based off our emotions and or feelings that can be manipulated. Manipulated by who? I'm glad you ask, because verse eight tells us that. The Lord cares for us. And he says that we must be sober minded. Verse 8 says be sober minded and or it doesn't even say and it's be sober minded semicolon be watchful. See, when we add the word and in there, that's another step. That's one more thing that we've got to try to do where the Bible doesn't tell us to try to do it. It says be sober minded. It doesn't say work at it. It doesn't say get at it or try at it. It says be sober minded semicolon be watchful meaning that the second clause is just as important as the first one. And it's a full sentence. Be sober minded and be watchful. No, be sober minded. 
Bring in your thoughts. Bring in your worries. Bring in your anxieties. Or here's a verse for you. Casting down all imaginations that would exalt itself up against the knowledge of God or that would puff itself up against the knowledge of God. Peter tells us that when we find ourselves in this in these places of distress or suffering, that we must be sober minded and we have to be watchful. We have to make decisions with a godly, sober mind. But then he tells us to be watchful. That's the key. And who are we to be watchful for? It's right here in verse nine or it's actually in the latter half. Of verse eight, he says, your adversary, your adversary, the devil. Yes, you all know I'm not the devil guy. You all know I'm not the devil guy. But we recognize that the devil is real. We recognize that he is an adversary of the body of Christ. But because we have this right here, we have the final answer. We have the conclusion of the story and we know that he's defeated. Therefore, we do not have to be fearful of him. But Paul tells us that he doesn't want us to be ignorant of his schemes. And now Peter tells us that we need to be sober, mind or mindful and watchful because he is real and he is an adversary and he prowls around. He prowls around. Watch this. Like a lion. It doesn't say he is a lion. He prowls around like a lion. A lion prowls. Um, he hunts and he's sneaky. If, well, I, I love the Animal Kingdom and all of those type of shows because I love to watch the lioness hunt. Because they're very crafty and they're hunting. Um, but he says that the devil, our adversary, is roaring. As a matter of fact, I, I misspoke. He says he's roaring like a lion. A lion also roars to warn off or to place fear in his enemies. So the devil, like a lion, makes loud noises and confusion to cause us to go in a state of shock and fear. But it says he's like a lion. So he's doing it intentional. To cause us to be more anxious and to cause us to worry. And if we're worrying and we're anxious, we're not depending on our Savior. So he tells us to be sober minded in our thinking and our decisions. We have to think a thing out. And everything we think before we take action on it or before we say something. I said it last week in last week's message. Filter it through God's eyes. Filter it through the mind of God. Filter it through your word. Filter it through the Holy Spirit so therefore you can make sober minded judgments before you act. And then not only should you be sober minded in your actions, Peter tells us that we need to be watchful. We need to be watchful. Jesus tells his disciples to watch as well as pray. I'll never forget a seasoned mother in the body of Christ. I was going somewhere fellowshipping with a group of people and she asked me a question. She's like, son, what they want you to do? I'm like, mother, they just want they ask me to pray. And she said, son, pray with your eyes open. She was telling me without telling me she was warning me because she knew some of the people about the surroundings that I was in. And she was telling me, don't go in just all holy and, and closed minded to be watchful about what's happening around me, because the people or the particular situations around me has the potential and is looking to do something. They says that the devil prowls like a rowing lot, prowls around. He prowls around, he's creeping and he's roaring like a lion and he's seeking someone that he can devour. He's seeking someone to devour. So in this chaos or in this world, we must be not only sober minded, but we need to be watchful. And we can only be really sober minded if we submit ourselves to the mighty hands of the Lord or submit ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit who will lead us and guide us to all truth and all understanding. I'm almost finished. Verse nine says, resist him being the devil. Firm in your faith. Now, let's look at this real quick, because um, I, I do want to address this because we say the devil and we'll use the word devil. Because remember, you all know me at the Lighthouse of the Pike, that I'm not the devil guy, meaning I'm not the guy that's going to come in the church and tell you, man, the devil was after me last night or because I got in a car accident that the devil tried to take me out or because the PA system is not work. All oh, the devil is now trying to interfere with our service. No, it's just technical difficulties. No, me and other driver was speeding the devil. Oh, or, and then you'll come in and you'll jump on the same train where the devil was after my house or the devil was after my son last night. And it's the devil, the devil, the devil. And we make the devil omnipresent like he's God and he's not. However, we do know that there were other demons that the devil himself was able to convince and they all rebelled against God. And um, there was some unknown of the heavenly host that was kicked out of heaven. 
and they were fallen angels, just like the devil is a fallen angel. So we call them demons now, where there is multiple demons and there is demonic influence on the earth. And because they all work together and him being the head of all of that, yes, we can just say the devil, but I just say that and I take time to say that, that the devil is not equal with God. He is a created being. He is not omnipresent like our God. So the devil is not at your house and at my house and at your neighbor's house and then across the world doing up some things. He's not omnipresent like God, but he is prowling around. He is moving about the earth. That's what he does. So he can move from one location to another. He's roaming. As a matter of fact, that was his first sentence that he was cast down to the earth and he had to roam the earth and he knows what his final judgment is going to be. So he's just roaming the earth, waiting to be sentenced on the final day of judgment. But in that, he's looking to see who he can destroy or devour. But we don't have to fear him because we know that he's defeated through Jesus Christ. Verse nine tells us to resist him. You and I have the ability to resist him. Yes, you can resist him. Jesus, I mentioned it while he was being tempted in the wilderness, resisted him. And likewise, now through him, you and I can resist him. We do not have to fall victim to his cunningness like Adam and Eve did in the garden. He says, resist him. Firm in your faith. Again, your faith has to be tested, but you have to be firm, situated and girded in it. Resist him. Knowing. Watch this. And this is what I'm after knowing that the same kinds of suffering is being experienced by your brotherhood. You can resist the devil. Knowing being firm in your faith, knowing that like you're being you're you're going through suffering and you're being tempted and you're trying to be pulled away and not to believe in the Lord God and doubt him that your brothers are experiencing experiencing the same suffering throughout the whole world. We all are experiencing suffering. So you do not have to feel alone, A, because God knows and God sees you and the Lord is always with you. And Peter tells us that he cares about you. But likewise, you can rest assured that your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ is experiencing the same suffering. So I know we say that I'm the only one. No, you're not. We all are experiencing suffering. So he says that you can resist the devil knowing that the same suffering is just being experienced through the brotherhood throughout the world. And verse 10 is our surety. It says, because after we have and after we have suffered just a little while, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And after you have suffered a little while, the God, it's a definite article there, the God, not a God. It isn't ambiguous. The God of all grace. He is the God of grace who has called you. He has personally called you to his internal glory in Jesus Christ. He himself and him alone will restore you, it says. So he will give back all that you think that you've lost. He will restore you. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you. And he will establish you. I'm going to say that one more time and I close. I close. And after you have suffered a little while, Weeping may endure, endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. It was just a few hours over the nighttime hour. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his internal glory in Christ himself. He will restore you. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you and he will establish you. And to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. That is all I have for you today. I pray that this word blesses you. I hope I pray that this word is encouraging to you. It's encouraging to me. I'm about to go home and read it all over again because we serve. We serve a God. We serve a God that not only will exalt us in his due time, but he also allows us to cast all of our anxieties and worries upon him because he cares for us. And he knows he understands that we are suffering and he allows us to go through it for just a little while. And he says that after we have suffered for a little while, that not only because he's the God of grace and the God of all grace who have called us into his eternal glory, that when he does that, that he will restore us, confirm us and strength, strengthen us and establish us in the presence of all of his heavenly hosts. 
And that message, again, is for me. And I pray that if you're someone that you feel like, where is God and all of this? Know that the Lord sees you and that the Lord cares for you. And if you're feeling any type of anxiety or worry, if you're if you're experiencing suffering, know that the suffering is going to produce something out of you. And that's called patience. And let patience have its full effect so that you may or let patience become complete and mature in you so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But then also knowing that the Lord God will restore you, confirm you and strengthen you. If you happen to listen to this message and you do not know the Lord Jesus as your savior, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he's Lord and died for your sins and resurrected on the third day and now ascended and sits at the right hand of the father, that you are saved. And you do not have to be in a church house. You do not need to have a pastor or a preacher to lay their hands on you right where you sit or stand. If you're listening to this message, will you please accept the Lord in your heart? If you feel that calling or that nudging or that pulling, because the Bible says that you cannot even come to the son unless the father is drawing you. So if you feel that tug, if you feel that pull, that there's something that you feel like, hey, I need to know more about this Jesus. That's God. That's God. That's God drawing you to his son. Will you accept him in your heart and confess with your mouth that he's Lord? The Bible says that you would be saved. The Bible says that you would be saved. And it is my prayer that you would accept him on today. Before we go, um, I apologize. We experienced some last minute technical difficulties um, on Thursday with Bible study. But please, please be here this Thursday. There's an awesome class. Um, chapter 13 is real good in the book of Acts. Chapter 13 is real good in the book of Acts, I promise you. Um, so please join us Thursday for a Bible study across the hall right here on the same platform. And then Lord willing, um, again, here next Sunday, right here in the sanctuary. Also, if you would like to give to the Lighthouse on the Pike Church, please visit our website. Thank you again for all of your support. We could not have maintained and do what we do without your help. Um, and you and, and your support have allowed us to help some others um, that have been in need as well. Um, but if you would like to give to the Lighthouse on the Pike Church, please visit our website on at the Lighthouse on the Pike dot org. The Lighthouse on the Pike dot org. That is all I have for you again. Um, I pray that uh, this message um, has ministered to your heart. Please go and read First uh, Peter in its entirety. This is five short uh, chapters and also Second Peter. And then go back and look at last week's message if you haven't seen it or review it again and read the book of James, another short book, just five short chapters. Um, and look at it in its totality and see how we are to live. It's, a, it's very, very, very practical how we are to live in according to our relationship with God and one another. Again, that's all I have for you. Grace and peace now unto him who is able to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God, be glory and majesty, dominion and power now and forever. And the people of God should say amen. Blessings.